Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to talk about mobilizing people to change for the public good. And it's going to be a little bit of a journey. So I'm going to sort of address all my previous speakers' journeys into this journey, too, because it involves a little bit of everything. Imagine if you happen to find yourself in New York City this summer. You'll be walking around, and all of a sudden, you'll be compelled to look up. And there, the iconic water tank on top, hundreds of feet above the buildings, will be dressed in art. And then you'll walk some more, and you'll see another, and then another. And what we're doing is we are going to be raising awareness on the global water issue, and mainly that there is not enough of it. And we are going to fill the skyline at about 100 tanks with dozens of the world's greatest artists, projecting a message loud and clear of changing our individual behaviors. When I think back, this is not an idea that came out of nowhere. This is an idea that came out of a long history, and that's what I'm going to talk about today, about how to great, take a vision and make it real, and where it all comes from. I was um, a child growing up in the Bronx, and it was a time of hip-hop, graffiti, disco dance. And I, uh, I always felt that I was black with white skin because I saw the racial inequalities in New York, and it affected me somehow. And uh, my uncle and my aunt were deaf, and they often were my babysitters. And my aunt would take me to the community center where all the deaf people would hang out. And I came from a poor family, and my grandfather gave me a camera, and it was broken. So I used to pretend to film in the community center. And I realized that I was filming an incredible silent movie. But what I didn't realize, it would be the most impactful moment of my life, and that it would become my motto, that I would be interested to help people that weren't heard. Fast forward. 15 years, I end up in Burma, the country with the most human rights violations in the world, people who were also not heard. And I found out about this small place called Taminya. It means Paddy Hill. And I found out that it was this like utopian sanctuary in the middle of an oppressive state of military dictatorship. How can it be? Burma. And then I realized there was this one guy, a monk, named Theodore Uwanaya, who didn't really take the government's patronage, instead used the donations from the people that came to get blessed by him to give back to society. And one of the first things he did was give them water. And I guess this was my first water impression, because you can't have life without it. And then he gave them infrastructure and education and food three times a day. And his motto was, uh, in Theravada Buddhism, they call it metta anthisa, which is loving kindness. And I went there to film, and I was pretty blown away by how that could be existing right in the middle of this serious oppression. After I left there, I ended up at the border of Thailand, Burma, and there were a lot of doctors, Canadian, Swiss, a Dutch who were trying to get medicine into the hospitals because they simply didn't even have antibiotics. And so I uh, basically said, okay, I'll do it. And so uh, they strapped on four packs of antibiotics on my body. I was petite and small, and I crawled into a little rice sack, and they put other rice sacks on top of me in a truck, and I ended up taking the most sweltering and horrible ride I've ever taken in a truck. Their Burmese roads are terrible. Um, and uh, we're passing checkpoints, landmines are going off, gunshots. And eventually, before I got there, I thought, I'm never doing this again. <laughs> but then I got there, and it was daunting. The amount of people sick without a simple antibiotic was unbelievable. 
And I thought, I'm doing this again. And I volunteered to do it again and again, eight, nine times later. And I became more clever and creative how I would get those packs in, increasing my load each time. I left there. And I decided, OK, I'm going to go back, pick up my camera, the lone filmmaker. And then I ended up taking a job with Medicine Sans Frontiers, which is Doctors Without Borders. And I took a job at the, the refugee camp that was uh, most under UN standards. 70,000 people crammed in. It's on the border of landmines. So you have a lot of landmine victims there. Most people couldn't last more a week. Uh, but I was motivated because I really liked helping people. And to watch MSF set up a refugee camp blew me away because the first thing they do is not bring medicine. The first thing they do is bring water. Because if you don't have water, you can't have 70,000 people in a refugee camp and doctors trying to help them because you need water. I was really impressed with watching the logistics of a team come together and assemble and participate in creating aid. And I realized that the lone filmmaker I was, I didn't have that much impact. That I need to change, I need to do something bigger, I needed to get more people behind me. So, eventually you're probably thinking, okay, that's nice, save the world, how do you make a living? You're right, there's no money in that. But I learned over a lot of traveling how to be a social entrepreneur. And I was quite an early environmentalist, and I saw an opportunity when I was living in Australia to sell vintage clothing. And I really was interested in taking something that was disregarded and making it cool. And I had a bit of style because it came from the Bronx, and uh, poor people used a lot of vintage clothing, so I had a kind of an eye for it. And so I was selling denim out of my 500-square-foot apartment. Eventually, I grew that business to 15,000 square feet, six stores, and a Japanese investor sold that business, went back on the road. Spending my money constantly traveling and helping. Eventually, I was in India, and I heard that there was this tech boom in San Francisco. And I thought, oh, that sounds cool. And I really love California ethics. I mean, hippies, freedom, all that stuff. I, I, I eat that up. And so I decided I was going to move there. Get on a plane, San Francisco, fantastic. Don't know anything about technology, that's OK. I ended up living in a commune called the Cauliflower Commune, quite a f famous commune for the artists that uh, surfaced out of there. It had a very interesting uh, living arrangements, but it was all about free. Free art, abandon your money, sh everybody pooled anything they had, free food, feed the poor, get donations, free food, feed the poor. So it was all kind of... And it was run by Irving Rosenthal, who was a beat editor who had created the beat generation in, in America. He edited uh, William Burroughs' Naked Lunch and was very friendly with people like Allen Ginsberg and some of the great literary minds of, of America. And he introduced me to a friend of his named Jack Smith, who was an artist who died in 1989. And I guess he knew I would have liked him because he was a nonconformist, he was anti-commercial, he was an environmentalist, and he uh, was really interested in queer aesthetics and breaking the boundaries on gender. So. I thought, yeah, he sounds pretty cool, especially at the fact that he had influenced three decades of artists, and most of the art world didn't even know about it. Bang, moved to New York, because that's where all the people are that I have to interview to make the film. So I get to New York, and uh, I realize I just took on a subject that's non-commercial and unfundable. Nobody's going to give me money for these kinds of uh, things. So I realized I had to now get some money to uh, get funding. So there's an annual event in the Hamptons where all the rich and famous people go. It's thrown by a guy named Robert Wilson. And so I had to sort of break in there to try to meet some people. Took a plastic bag, plunged myself in the forest, changed, and entered the party, I guess you could say illegally. Um, <laughs> 
So I got into the party, and um, I sort of got in with this older man. He looked like he was dressed in inexpensive clothing. He had a tear in his left shoe, more my speed. Everybody else was in, you know, Chanel and Dolce, and I, you know, I didn't have that type of clothing at the time. And so um, I started talking to him, and he became very impressed that I broke into the party and invited me for lunch the next day. He ended up being this man named Henry Buell, who's one of the largest photo collectors in, the, in America. And um, he gave me my first check to do my movie and became my art patron and gave me a space to work from. But I still needed more money, but what I ended up learning is, and this is probably where I learned to mobilize people, because when you have a subject that's politically engaging and has a social justice cause and passion, people will get behind it. I had over 100 interns work on that film who helped me because we couldn't afford staff. And people told me that the film, oh, it won't matter, it won't matter. But the film did matter. It had its premiere at Tribeca, and that was first, one of the first of its many awards. It ended up being um, a teaching tool in film schools throughout America and Europe. It ended up uh, advancing a gay rights agenda, and it ended up really educating the entire art world on who the real Warhol was. So, never believe negativity. You have to go with your passion. So, through all this time, water is always on my mind. And uh, in Burma and Africa, India, it was always a matter of life and death then. But in 2007, it became a matter of life and death for me. I was in the southern tip of Ethiopia, where the Mercy, the Hammer, and the Banner tribes live. It's one of the most remote places in the world. And I got sick. And so I'm going to show you a little In 2007, video. while making a documentary in Ethiopia, filmmaker Mary Jordan fell ill in a remote village. The women of that village took her in and nursed her back to health. In return, they asked for one thing, that she make a promise to tell the world about their biggest problem, water. About how it's so scarce, women and children sometimes spend eight hours a day collecting it. About how it's often so contaminated, it ends up doing more harm than good. About how over one billion people don't have access to clean water. So she promised. I came back to New York, and I looked up. I saw these icons, water tanks, and decided, let's transform them to an awareness campaign using art. And that's when I established Word Above the Street to put these things to work. Water tanks, 17,000 of them above the streets of Manhattan, perfect symbols of water abundance. Iconic, unmistakable, and silent. Until now. This spring, our inaugural effort comes to life with one of the largest public art shows New York has ever seen, the Water Tank Project. We're going to use these water tanks as canvases and cover them with works of art to raise awareness about the water crisis. Over 100 established and emerging artists are taking part. From Staten Island to the Bronx, their artwork will be seen on rooftops all over the city. Parties and events will be held all summer long. Tours, talks, and educational programs will help everyone get involved. We're spreading the word with a full ad campaign, including video, wild postings, and social media. And we're taking the water tank project to other cities all over the world. Because the water crisis is truly global. But the best part is, it's also solvable. Figure out some small way to help any organization that's helping to bring clean water to people anywhere in the world, and you'll be part of this group. We want New York City and the world to see the possibilities. To believe. To put water above all. Put water above all. Put water above all. Put water above all. So about a year after I came back from Ethiopia, I came up with this crazy idea. And uh, one day, I just took my proposal out, and I said, I'm doing this. I had no idea that it would take me over five years and that I would have to organize an army of people. The water tank is an icon, and everybody recognizes it. 
why not use artists to turn it into activism, to project a message, billboards of activism? Can art change the world? Absolutely. And I started to realize that subconsciously, I started to scale my projects because I realized that participation in numbers and people have more impact. And the water issue needs more impact. The water tank project is temporary, but the message is forever because one in nine people do not have access to clean water, and we must change our disastrous, disastrous, wasteful ways. And, yeah, this is, I would say it's about awareness, awareness that, you know, that these little things matter. Plastic bottles, waste, running the tap, reducing meat consumption, protecting our water sources. This is the future. And this became the, the, the iconic reason that this now has become the journey of my life. And it should be the journey of yours because at the end of the day, everybody is just hoping that something will happen. Hope is not a strategy. Doing something is. And each and every one of you have a role in it. So if I leave with a single message, it's this. Stop waiting. Stop waiting. Because each of you can do something about it. I have, and so can you. Put water above all. Thank you.